Hi, this is Ken Jureski, and today we're talking pictures with Tina Lloyd. Tina is a former picture editor for the New York Times. She worked uh, mainly in the style section. She worked very close with uh, the legendary photographer, although he thought of himself mainly as a reporter. We can think of him as a photographer, Bill Cunningham, and she just edited uh, his latest book. It's on the New York Times bestseller list. It's uh, pretty much a must-have for photographers and fashionistas alike. alike. So uh, welcome, Tina. How are you? Thank you, Ken. I'm fine. Thank you. I'm very excited. Uh, you know, uh, living in New York as a photographer, Bill was, um, he was, he was a guy that you'd see around in unexpected places. You'd see him on the street. And yes. it was just like a comforting presence to always have him around there busily working, doing his craft. And then, you know, uh, on Sunday mornings, uh, to, to get that, that, that five pound, uh, block of newsprint and mm -hmm. go to the style section and see what he had seen the week before he was, he was a treasure and I, I loved his work and I just, I'm so excited to talk to you about Bill. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to talk about Bill. I'm excited that we finally have a collection of his photography. As you said, he always referred to himself as, you know, he, he said he was a columnist who wrote with pictures and that is exactly what he did. And he became famous by running 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 pictures in a column, which were about an inch by, you know, an inch. They were tiny. But so many of those pictures on their own were wonderful. And many of them were very humorous. And I wanted this book to be a photography book. I didn't want this to be a rehash of the of the columns or the format that he used for the columns. I wanted the photographs to have breathing room. I wanted the photographs to be photographs and not pieces in a mosaic. So that's interesting. What, what do you think Bill would have thought about your uh, approach to the book? Well, yeah, <laughs> I spoke <laughs> about that a little bit in the preface, but, but we all know what his columns were like. We've seen his columns. We're all familiar with his columns and many of his columns were reprinted there were, there were uh, Photoville af after he died in Photoville in Brooklyn ran, had large blowups of many of his columns. But so many of those pictures are just wonderful images. And he would crop the picture obviously down to its essence, right? To the shoe or the, or, you know, maybe head to toe ensemble or a bag. And sometimes there were other funny things in the background. And that's what I wanted people to see. I, I, Bill was also very interested in juxtaposition. It was very important, you know, what was next to what. And also within single photographs, you know, somebody would be wearing, I, there's one photograph in the book of somebody wearing something very crazy and loud and psychedelic who happens to be standing next to somebody else who's wearing something crazy and loud and psychedelic. And it's a funny picture. And it's funnier when it's bigger. And he also had this wonderful picture once of about five women in a row, each wearing a different color sort of shift dress, just, you know, a pink dress, a yellow dress, a green dress. And that also ran very tiny in his column. And I'm running it as a spread over two pages. Right. So I think, I think Bill in the end would have understood, let's put it that way. And I think he might have actually, ha he might have looked at his pictures a second time and said, hmm, you know, that wasn't bad. What, uh, he was, I, how can you replace a, a, a photographer, a, a journalist don't. like that? You don't, you absolutely don't. Bill worked every day on the street and then at night covered society. And he worked seven days a week and every, every, week, every week, every year. He never took a vacation. Uh, he would go to the Paris fashion shows twice a year and do street columns and, and party columns from Paris. But he, wor he worked all the time, all the time. There were times I think he ate three meals a day at the, at the New York Times cafeteria. Well, he was famous. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, take, a, he wouldn't take a cucumber sandwich from a- right. Nothing, not, yeah. even a, not even a bottle of water. He wouldn't right. take anything. And that's also one of the reasons he wanted to be a freelance photographer. He did not want to go on staff at the Times. And he, you know, he worked for the style section. He really wasn't on the daily roster of, of you know, photographers doing assignments that, that uh, 
that we had at the time. He, he belonged to the style department, but he didn't want to go on staff. He only went on staff at the very end of 1993 because he got hit by a truck and he needed the medical insurance. And so then he went on staff, but he was allowed to continue as he continued. He was allowed to, to be his own editor and, and go about doing his columns the way he always had. So yeah, that's, uh, I mean, he's also famous for, uh, not only did he take any freebies, but he, he, he refused any, any, anything like that. But he also, uh, I mean, I think one of his quotes was saying something like, if you take their money, they can tell you what to do. What to do, yeah, yes. Yeah, so, that's why uh, he wanted to be free. That was very important to him. He was also allowed to retain custody of his negatives. Sorry, we froze up. Okay. Okay. So let's, uh, so um, he, was, he, he was also famous for uh, keeping control of his work, Yes. Uh, not taking the money. He, 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 he his work no was more than money. Yeah. No, no resales either. He didn't want any of his photographs sold. Oh, I didn't realize that. Um, I think that might've changed toward the end. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but he didn't want, he, if somebody wanted a picture, he would get them a picture. A lot of times people who were in his street columns wrote to him and that was always the best way to reach Bill. He had to write to Bill. Uh, requesting a copy, and he would go take care of it and send them a copy, send them a print. Yeah, you didn't you didn't want to talk to Bill when he was working. I know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and things became more difficult after the documentary on him came out in 2012 because then he became a celebrity. And he never wanted that. He never wanted that. He said people would yell, you know, "Hey, Bill!" as he was bicycling. You know, he he bicycled all over Manhattan and did so until you know the day he died, and he was 87 years old. And he bicycled everywhere. And people would say, hey, Bill, hey, Bill. Well-meaning, but you shouldn't yell at somebody on a bicycle in, in Manhattan, you know, bicycling through Manhattan. So there were times it was, it was a little bit scary for him. Uh, but yeah, people started to parade in front of him after that when they, when they knew who he was. But before, before the movie came out, the film, the documentary film, I don't remember the name right now, but before that film came out, uh, he was well known inside the fashion industry. Absolutely, yes. I mean, yes. he was. How, what kind of? I know he didn't want power, but he had he had a certain level of authority in that industry. Because he was a walking encyclopedia on the history of fashion. He was a fashion historian, and he would sometimes, with glee, you know, with 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 a sort of a sly look in his face, come back and talk about how some designer had just ripped off some other designer from the 60s or the 50s. He had an encyclopedic knowledge of, of fashion designers. He also had a deep and abiding love for fashion as an art form. He could be brought to tears talking about a show from one year or another. He treated fashion the way people treat art or opera. He was, he was very serious about it. And, and he knew exactly what he was talking about. As I said, he was considered a fashion historian and everybody in the industry knew that. They respected him for that. Bill also, during when he did cover Fashion Week, uh, Bill sat in the front row. He did not uh, stand where the other photographers have to stand when they're shooting. Bill sat in the front row because he was there as more of a photographer. What's the, uh, just out of curiosity, I know you you're, you're know a lot about style yourself. What's the statute of limitations? How soon do you have to wait before you bring something like bell bottoms back? What, and, and You know, I, I, it's, that's not up to me. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's up to, one thing though I've, no, I've always noticed that white go-go boots from the 60s don't seem to have ever come back. I don't know why, that just, that's one of those things. People don't like white boots, I think, white. Those typical white boots with the black heels from the sixties, but that's beside the point. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't have an answer for how long you have to wait. No. But I mean, that's that's the thing, and it's it, with photography, it's the same way. Um, sometimes you don't realize because you're a new photographer, you're a young photographer, that you're actually retreading ground. Um, right. But I've been in a few ateliers, and they have. They're famous for their their book bookshelves, yes. and they just they pull from everywhere. Yes, yes, 
and retreading actually, as you just said, is a good word for it. Some people are not necessarily, I mean, how many times can you make a, a you know, there are only certain amounts of lengths. There are either, you know, it's above the knee, below the knee, to the end. There, there are certain things that you simply need to um, reinterpret, let's say. Um, and you're not necessarily, you're either paying perhaps homage to something that came before you, but again, you're taking something, designers, uh, in fact, Bill's done several columns on reinterpreting classics, you know, trench coats, typical trench coats that have crazy, uh, collars. I mean, designers like to do things to leave their mark on, on a staple, but there are certain things that are simply bread and butter. And it's up to the designer to put his or her mark on bringing that forward or showing us something that perhaps has not been shown before. Well, how much of that is actual form, like this is my vision and function, as in we need this type of buttonhole because that's going to be cheaper to produce in a mass quantity. And I'm thinking about this because uh, with photography, our, 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 our form isn't really following our function right now. Mm -hmm. um, with photography, it's got a very almost kind of uh, glass plate feel to it now. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it has to do with photographers not having time to work in the field. But uh, the, the, the question is, you know, we could do anything with photography right now with action, with low light, but a lot of it seems to be almost kind of like if we were shooting with glass plates. And I'm, so I'm wondering, to take that to a fashion uh, perspective, how much of it is, oh, this is gonna look cool, and, or we can produce this in, in a, in a, in a cost-effective way. I mean, is that, does that come into the? Well, that's, there's a whole other level for that, which they call <laughs> fast fashion. You know, it comes down, you know, it'll, it'll come down a New York or Milan or Paris runway, and a week later we'll be in H&M or Zara. I mean, there's a whole level of store that, that will produce a much less expensive version of something that you saw in, a, in an atelier or on a, on a runway. So I mean, what at, at what point? I mean, when you look at a McQueen, is that is that for show or is that for actual wearing? And I'm sorry, I know these are very basic oh, yeah. questions. It's always for actual wearing. It is. It's. It's always going to be for actual wearing. Always, there is always a client out there that's being designed for. Really. Yes. So, even though, yeah, you know, the circles I I, I run in, I might never see that. In the, in the wild correct but it's out there it's out there and people are paying i think five thousand dollars for a t-shirt correct yes <laughs> yes but there's also couture there's runway there's what we call ready to wear and then there's couture which is a whole other level of fashion that's the 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 handmade very expensive uh made to order for you uh world What's more, fa what's more fascinating to you? I mean, because photography has these same ki kind of nuances, but you've worked in style and fashion. Where, where's your, where, where's your passion lie between the two? Well, it isn't. It's more about the creation. I liked being a photo editor in style because I got to have a hand in creating the photograph. Um, I had also worked on the news side. I had, I had done stints in, in Metro and Foreign and National, and I don't take anything away from news photojournalism at all. I preferred working on stories where we had to come up with the picture. There were a lot of concept stories in style. Style would do cover stories on, you know, drug addiction. Style would do on what, you know, whatever the new drug is that everybody's using. Uh, style could do stories on adultery, style could do stories on, on friendship. These were concepts that we needed to go to a drawing board and come up with a picture. I mean, a lot of it was studio work. Um, you know, a lot of things like that were shot in the studio, and I, but I enjoyed creating the picture. I, I, that was my favorite. And of course, it's, it's always 
creative to find the right photographer for the right job. Um, but I, I did like sitting around and talking to a photographer and thinking about what exactly are we going to shoot for this story? Or what can we make? What can we do to, to illustrate this story? So where's that? I mean, if you think of jazz, I always think of jazz when I'm thinking of photography in this way. And you might have like notes on a page and this is what we're going to play. But between having the notes played, having your sketch on, you know, you have your photo sketched out, you, you know what your concept is. And between that and what comes out of the camera, there's a magic that happens there. Yes. Uh, and a lot of work too. Right. What, uh, I guess I don't have a question. <laughs> well, well, it's, it's um, and it also, I can circle back to Bill in this. When, when Bill was at the Times in the 90s and the aughts, those were the days where we had a very robust staff of staff photographers. And, you know, they went out every day, they covered news, uh, some features, but a lot of them were news people. And they tended, not all of them, but some tended to poo-poo what Bill did. You know, what does Bill do? He stands on the corner and he photographs women as they walk by. And Bill, again, always, always considered himself not to be a real photographer. He did not put himself in the class of the photographers who went out and covered news and fires and wars. Bill, Bill knew that he was doing something different. He never set foot in the photographer staff room um, at the New York Times. He never did because, because he felt he wasn't on a par with the other photographers. But on the other hand, so many photographers did not appreciate what Bill was doing. Bill had a vision. Bill would go out, Bill didn't just photograph every single person who walked by, that's not what he did. He photographed people who were wearing something interesting and he would notice the same interesting thing, let's say, go by all day long. And then he would do a column on how everybody has this, this handbag or everybody's wearing this shoe. And then he would also find the one person who might be one step ahead of everybody else with something new that everybody didn't have. Bill, that was Bill's breaking news. I mean, literally, he would call up and say, you know, we're going to rip up the layout. I found something else. I'm going to do something else. But in the end, who became the legend, right? Well, right. I mean, it's all, it's all about observing and sharing what you observe. That's the essence, right? And he pieced it together. He was able to piece together what he observed in a so, way that was informative and entertaining. People would right. open the Sunday style section and there were, you know, 60 people, uh, you know, 60 pairs of platform shoes of all shapes and sizes. I mean, he would do things that were amusing. He would also throw in what I would call his, his New Yorky pictures, you know, a fountain that was, that was fro you know, because it was zero degrees outside, there was a fountain that was frozen. I mean, he would use that in a layout with, that had, you know, fringe in it or something. He would mix, he would use red flowers in a layout of people walking around wearing red. I had this picture in the book of, a, of people sitting, it, it might've been Bryant Park, um, people sitting near yellow daffodils and they're wearing yellow. A few people, there are about three or four people in that picture who are wearing yellow. And Bill, you know, it's juxtaposition that always meant so much to him too. You said so many important things in that one little uh, stretch there. Uh, it's about, it's about uh, the content of the image. It's about how the image is presented. It's about entertaining. You have to entertain, you have to get somebody's uh, attention before you can you can transmit what you observe to them, which you, you can share that knowledge. Uh, and you have to do it. Funny. Yeah, I'm sorry, he liked being funny. He had a very mischievous side to him. And, and a lot of his layouts were incredibly amusing. Um, every, about three or four times a year, he would do this whole layout on everybody's wearing black. Right. And there, in, one, in one of those layouts, he happened to stumble upon four men in white tie and tails crossing the street and there are you know white lines in the in the street in the box we allowed to and it was just a hysterical picture so here are all these other people wearing all these great clothes and then he's got like these four guys in their in their uh white tie and tails coming across the street yeah i, I mean that's it's 
and that's and that's how you get that following. That's how you get that. Uh, I mean, I don't know. You probably the, the the New York Times probably did surveys, but when you get that Sunday newspaper, I wonder. Do you know how many people went to the style section first? Do I know for certain? Do I have facts and figures? No, but the style section that that the nickname was always the women's sports section. You know, right. right. <laughs> But Bill, Bill's column was extremely popular. There's no question about that. He was, he was a, a New York, uh, he, was, he was declared a New York City living landmark. Right. What, to, tell me about the process. You know, you, you, you had, you talked about prints. You have your digital files at the New York Times. Um, but he had his own archive too. For he did, and he didn't go digital. He didn't go digital for a long. He didn't go digital for a long time. He did not give up his film camera for a very long time. And we had a photo lab. And once the Times went digital, and all our photographers started started shooting digital, that lab was disbanded. We weren't. We didn't need to develop film. But Bill was still shooting film. Bill would go out to one-hour photo places and have his film developed. And then after a while, the one-hour photo places were disappearing because the digital thing was catching on everywhere. And so Bill's uh, film was sent out to, uh, you know, more professional labs. But after a while, he just threw in the towel and, you know, and the Times brought reps from different camera companies to try to talk to him and show him what to do. And sometimes he'd disappear on the day that the rep was showing up with the, with the camera. He eventually did go digital because he had to. Uh, but he he shot film a lot longer than anybody else. I mean, he wasn't uh, he he was he he could really care less about the the camera in his hand. I mean, he was using right. Minolta, well, I that, think. Yeah, yeah, and Pentax or whatever. Yeah, I mean, he was, was using the one with the half frame. Uh, well, that was way back. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the first cameras I think that he was given. It, there was a photographer, an English photographer. Bill was a writer for Women's Wear Daily for a while, and he was going overseas to do the shows. And there was a writer, a, a photographer who gave him this half frame camera and said, use it like a notebook, hmm. which is exactly what Bill did. But the half frame camera gives you 72 frames right. on a roll. And editing that was one of the things that made me almost lose my mind uh, working on this book was going back to these old, and they're tiny, you know, it's, 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 it's not like you get, have larger negatives, you have the same negative strip, but there's two frames where there used to be one frame and they're small. And Bill would sometimes, there'd be five, six, seven people in these little frames and it's like, whoa, you know, who are, you know. It, are, that, that was a hard part here. Are you, are you looking at the negs or are you looking at contact sheets? Both, both. Tell me. Yeah, I was looking at both. Yeah, can you go through your process because there's a lot of people that will watch this and they've they've never uh, seen a light table. So can you just go through the yeah. physical process? Yeah. <laughs> I hadn't been in a light table for a while. When I started going, um, when I when I started working on the earlier stuff, which is the stuff in the archive, um, I brought some of that back to the Times. His archive is in Rockland County. Uh, it's not in the Times building. It's in a storage facility in Rockland County. So I would bring bring things back to the times and sit at the light table with the the loop um and and look there were some things there were there were many things that did have contact sheets yes but many things didn't i was also under a time constraint it would take years i mean somebody would really need to park themselves in that archive five days a week for years to really thoroughly be able to go over everything and it may still be impossible. There may still be gems. I mean, that's that's the thing. I would be looking for something specific, and then I'd find all this other stuff that was that was wonderful. And I, I would I, we have to have this. We have to have this. And and you know we couldn't. We were running out of time, and it was just not feasible to be able. There, there were, we only had so many pages in the book, but it, it's it's unbelievable how many books you could get on you could you could do on Bill Cunningham. Well, the. Uh, your, your new book, Bill Cunningham on the Street, it's not a yeah. small book. It's like 360 no. pages yeah. or something. And that's, I can't even begin to tell you what fraction that is of his output. It's and certainly a lot of what he shot, you know, was not, you know, he discarded. Yes. I mean, he would, he would look at, you know, a roll of 36, right? Look at 36 images and he'd mark off, 
you know, five to 10 on each role. And some of these were th for things he would be working on in the future. I mean, one week he might be doing something on everybody's wearing yellow, but he also sees people wearing stripes and it's like, okay, I'll mark those off and I'll go back to that when I see more people wearing stripes. So he would go back. He had a knowledge of all his film too, of what was when and what he shot months ago. A street fashion column for a given Sunday could have images on it that were taken three months prior. See, I didn't know that. I just, I always assumed they were all made the same week. No, they were not all made the same week. They were made within the same season. Right. Or less. But if, yeah, he was, he, he definitely had, I mean, it takes a few weeks sometimes to figure out what the trend is. I mean, he might see people walking by wearing stripes and then not ever not see anybody else walking by wearing stripes. So when, when you're editing and you're on the light table, you're looking at a contact sheet, you're yes. looking at a, yeah. a leg, and you find a select. Yes. Uh, where do you, what's your process from there? Do you, do you have prints made? Do you have a scan no, made? Yeah. Where, Scan. If I'm if if we were able to scan, we scanned. Uh, a lot of the things that were scanned in the '90s when we first went digital were scanned at way too low a resolution to run in a book. Right. And don't forget also with Bill. I mean, everybody knew that he was going to run you know 40 to 60 pictures in a column, and that they were going to they were going to run small. So you didn't necessarily have to scan his work in that high res because it was going to run very small to begin with, it wasn't going to be very big. So I was in the situation where pretty much, there were about 15 to 15 or more years that I absolutely had to have rescanned, had to, because what we had in the system was not usable. So this, the book, I mean, it's like, it's 40 years worth of work, something like that. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> maybe 50, okay. I don't remember anymore, yeah, 50. How do you, as an editor, not only do you have to edit this, you have to come up with a narrative, don't you, to make the book hold together? I, yeah, I, I went into this um, saying from the get-go that it, it had to be just his street fashion work. There was talk of maybe doing something that encompassed one giant book encompassing both. I said, no, 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 that's impossible. Don't even, don't go there. It's just, it's ridiculous. So we were gonna just do street fashion. Um, and the best way I thought to organize the book is by decade. Showing again, when you, when you go through the work of Bill Cunningham, you're essentially getting fashion history. So going, showing or organizing it by decade seemed to be the most sensible thing to do. But then, but... How do, how do you, I, 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 I don't have a copy of the book yet, but I looked at uh, what I could find. It seems very cohesive as both um, kind of a fashion history book, but also as a photography book. That's not accidental. You had to have more than just That's a, what I went a, into. a decade. Yes, I went, well, the other, the other, uh, the other, my other mantra was this is a photography book. I didn't want it to be a rehash of, you know, Bill's greatest hits in terms of his columns. There's never more than four pictures on a page. And we keep to the Bill uh, thesis of, you know, putting things next to one another that were, that belong next to one another. But in my case, in the book, I also had pictures nod to one another. There'd be a picture on, there were some pages that only had one picture on them. And the picture on the left, had to somehow nod to connect to the picture on the right. Didn't need to be the same fashion. Didn't need to be the same. It didn't need to necessarily be clothing from the same era, but the pictures needed to nod to one another. I have, you know, I have, I have one page that has pictures of, you know, Bill would like to photograph people during the holidays carrying giant stuffed animals down the street. And on the other page, there's a guy, you know, with his baby. So it looks better than I'm making it sound. Let's put it that way. But it's the, the pictures on the given pages needed to nod to one another. That I felt was very important. So um, it's like writing a book is what you're saying. You have one paragraph yeah. doesn't exist. There needs to be, there needs to be a visual relationship of sorts 
uh, between the pictures, especially the ones. I mean, that's where I thought we could have a little fun with humor. Um, there was another shot, another uh, spread in the uh, uh, teens where I have, you know, there's this group of fashionistas crossing the street, all wearing very, very extremely fashionable clothes and the street's gray and everything around them is gray and they really stand out. On the opposite page, I have a guy in a yellow suit and there's a taxi going by him, right behind him. So he blends in, one group stands out and the other, and the other guy blends in. So there always, there's always, there's a- something. There's always something. <laughs> there's, all, there's, a, there's a melody, there's a harmony. I don't even know what these terms mean, yes. but yeah. I don't understand music. I don't understand jazz, but I know when it works. There's a relationship, yes in this book between the pictures uh, going from page to page. So it's not a matter, as you said, it, you can't just pick out the greatest hits, uh, organize them by year and throw those on the pages of a book. Yeah, because it has to make sense. It has to flow. Um, every, you, it can't be unrelated from page to page. There needs to be a flow. I kept thinking of people going by, you know, Bill, Bill would do columns sometimes, well, here's what teenagers are wearing, okay? And it's a bunch of different things, but, the, but there's a theme, okay? Or here's what everybody in Paris is wearing to the shows. And again, it's a bunch of different people wearing different things, but the theme, there, there's a broader theme. That exists in places in the book. We had to have a place for something that was a great photo that maybe didn't necessarily have a pair, but I would try, it just still needed to flow in a way that makes sense. You need to be able to just, you need to go with the, it's almost like being on one of those moving sidewalks at an airport. You've got people at the gates, you know, and they, they're all waiting for their respective planes, but you have these sort of unrelated people going by in the middle. And there needed to be spots in the book where we could, we could, have these wonderful little moments like you know a teenager wait on standing on line for like a lady gaga concert or something who's wearing something that doesn't necessarily relate to everybody else but somehow if i put that teenager on one page there should be something opposite that person that somehow makes the flow it shouldn't be a jarring uh transition from one page to another so when i think of bill's work and i think of you know, the printed page, whether it's in the newspaper or, or this latest book, there is this, this, uh, the ability to do what you just described, have this flow and everything. And now, uh, and I'm thinking about, you know, as photographers on their website, there's, they send a photo editor like you a link and they're like, look at my work. Mm -hmm. There isn't really that same opportunity to do that or that same capability to do it digitally as you can on paper. Right, and I don't mind that. If, if, if a photographer wants to send me his work, show me whatever you want to show me. You know, I am looking at one picture at a time for that. that but, the, when, but when you're in a, when you're looking at a book and you're, you're flipping pages and you're going from page to page, it has to have some sort of ability to, to, to transition from page to page. And again, sometimes it was just very funny to have picture, you know, X and picture Y and Z on another page. There was some pictures that never appeared together in the same column, but it works now. That's what I think Bill would have been happy about, is that somehow we still make a fashion connection between these shots that were never, that never shared a space together before. I'm thinking about some of the, 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 the work from the 70s in the book. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea how much uh, of that was originally printed in the, in the newspaper? It was hard to tell. Um, he shot um, in the 70s also for the Chicago Tribune. Oh. Covered, there was a very famous fashion event, which we have a chapter on, a subchapter in the book called The Battle of Versailles. And it pitted, it was a fashion quote unquote competition, which was essentially a fundraiser for Versailles. It pitted five American top designers against five French top designers. And to make a long story short, the Americans went there without lavish sets and costumes and the French threw on a hell of a show. 
And the Americans went there with a lot of sportswear and the French designers showed a lot of couture and evening wear and the Americans won. And Bill covered that for the Chicago Tribune. And some of that was actually in the in um, half frame, but some of it was, was also in 35 millimeter. But that was something that I really wanted to show in the book because a lot of what Bill shot for the Battle of Versailles has never been seen. And it was an event, that was an event also that Bill could reduce Bill to tears when he talked about how magnificent it was. So the, the, the thing that's curious to me is some of these images, and you know, it's uh, like you described, it's all about juxtaposition, it's all about combining elements. Some of these images, I don't think if you looked at them uh, less than say an eight, eight by 10, you can't read these images. They're so complex and yeah. there's so much going on. I don't know that a lot, I, I'm wondering a lot of this stuff, it's probably never really been seen before, properly well, at least. Hasn't. So, I mean, some, some of it has, um, some of it, if, if, if I found a print and he identified the people on the back of it, then I kind of thought probably it ran, otherwise he wouldn't have done that. Um, but a, a good chunk of the Battle of Versailles um, photos have not run before. And the pictures from the 70s, I mean, that was just a wonderful, that, that's one of the, I, I wanted the 70s to be as, as large a chapter as it could be because there were just so many wonderful pictures of fashion folk from, from that era. Um, wonderful shots of Halston and and young Diane von Furstenberg, young Ralph Lauren, young Marc Jacobs. I mean, there was just wonderful, wonder, there were wonderful images from those days. And Bill, Bill, a lot of uh, Bill's coverage of the fashion shows, people in front rows, people at parties. Something, something that stood out to me, and, and I don't want to say this in the wrong way, I don't want to, uh, but I don't know if it's, it's, uh, it's, it's what you brought with your editing. A lot of, and you know, Bill cropped his images. We talked about that. And he was very point oriented with his images. But when you look at the book, you're seeing more images that are crafted as a photographer would craft an image. There's right. layers in there. Yes, absolutely. And, and that, does, that didn't come across in his printed work in the New York Times. And I'm wondering, is that really Bill or is that more of your edit? Bill, Bill, Bill's work as we know it, his columns, that format did not really begin until the 90s. Okay. Bill did shoot street style, yes, but the layouts before we started that standalone Sunday style section, the layouts um, did have a little more breathing room for the pictures. He had maybe eight pictures and he also shot with, uh, he shot stories, he shot fashion stories with some of our fashion writers. Those shots, the early shots of the 70s, yeah, what struck me totally was that those shots were meant to be seen right. fairly full frame. They were not meant to be cropped. That, that, um, that format, as I said, began later on. And that's what Bill, that's what created the Bill Cunningham that we know. I mean, Bill, Bill was known for those layouts that were chocolate. Yeah, everybody's wearing the same thing, layouts. But in the early days, and, and he, I, I don't want to say he wasn't shooting on the street. He still did. But he did do a lot more than that. He shot at parties. And again, it was always focused on what people were wearing, yes, to, for the most part. But um, there are just wonderful fashion show. Again, there, there was this wonderful picture of, of uh, a front row shot I had of Bianca Jagger, Lauren Bacall, and Diana Vreeland with that front row look. That, that fashion fashion editors have that that intense look of I I am studying what's what I'm seeing and I get it. What uh, I mean when you say you could do, probably there's probably another ten books easily. Yes. <laughs> easily. Yes. Um, when I see like some of that stuff from the '70s, his street photography, it's very you know Winograndi-ish. It's yes. It's got that street photography vibe, even though I don't think he was, I don't think that was on his. No, yeah, I don't think that was on his mind either. I, I always think he was always, he was always 
interested in fashion. This is somebody who dropped out of Harvard after one semester because he wanted to make women's hats. You know, he left Harvard, he moved to New York, and he became a milliner. So this is somebody who was always interested, who always intended to have a career in fashion and style. So when he started shooting, you know, he was working for Women's Wear Daily. He was writing about fashion. I mean, this was his world, and this was, this was the world he was going to inhabit for the rest of his life. This was his field. And yeah, the early, I, I wish I would have had more time. Like I said, you would have to just camp out in that archive, right. go through everything very, very slowly because there's so much material. I had some time constraints and also it was difficult having the archive not be near the Times office. And, you know, there, there, were, there were several um, hurdles like that we had to overcome. But still, there's so much in the archive that it just doesn't, it, there, there's so much good stuff anywhere you look if, in the early uh, in, in his early folders, you're going to find something that's a gem. Tell me about the eighties. I mean, at some point, uh, was it paper magazine that he co-founded details uh, details? Okay. Details, details right? Yes. Yeah. And um, he kind of, he kind of shifted to the downtown scene a little bit, didn't he? Yes. Yes. He, he um, explored other neighborhoods uh other than 57th and 5th uh, <laughs> but that's that's bill cunningham corner for sure um yeah he did expand a little bit and he continued his work at the times even when he was working for details he worked for both i mean d did he did he actually embrace kind of the 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 punk or the new wave scene? he recognized it did he embrace it did he appreciate everything it? this is this is he did an entire column on you know african-american you know, young men wearing their pants below their rear ends. He's, he's done, he go, went to the Puerto Rican Day Parade every year and came up with fashion columns from the parade. He would go to Wigstock. He would go to the Gay Pride Parade. He'd go to the Thanksgiving Day Parade. Um, there's one anecdote in the book where he, there was a, there's a photograph in the book of Shaquille O'Neal and he's wearing a white mink zip up jacket. Now, you don't think for a single minute Bill Cunningham knew who Shaquille O'Neal was. Right, right. And Bill Cunningham was photographing a white zip-up mink jacket being worn by this man. But he also, the, there, was a, there was an NBA players strike that year, and the strike was resolved. And there were a bunch of basketball players on the street talking to members of the press and milling around. It was Shaquille O'Neal, Charles Barkley was there, and various other people. And Bill, Bill called me from the street. That was one of his breaking news moments. He called me from a payphone because there were payphones back then, and said, "We're going to rip up what what I've done, and I've found all these marvelous, you know, tall men. And I'm told they're, you know, I heard they're basketball players, and they're all wearing the most marvelous things." And he came, and he used the word marvelous a lot. And he came back, and he had all this film of all these all these people, and and it was, and, but he didn't know who any of them were. And a lot of us in style didn't know who any. <laughs> <laughs> so luckily the sports department was next to the style department then and we all went over there with Bill's pictures and, and they helped us ID who all these people were. And he did this whole layout on this. This was the end of the NBA strike and he found he made it a fashion moment. Well, that's the essence of just being an observer, right? I mean, yes. you find something. Well, yes, yes. And he went out after 9-11 and he did a 9-11 column. 9-11 was on a Tuesday. And Bill went out every day that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, photographing the city. He had pictures in that in that column of people holding signs. I mean, that was Bill at work as a photographer, people with American flags, people crying. He would he he did news events. He also he also did a huge column on uh, Hurricane Sandy. Do you think uh, do you think a, a guy like Bill has any choice when he's doing this kind of stuff? Is it just something he can't help? but do he lived it he lived it he bled it he went out there's a picture we have a um a sub chapter on, on chapter on weather photos in the book because bill was very big on going out through wind and rain and snow and sleet and he went on the weather so the morning after sandy and it was still windy and and rainy and so he has this photograph of three four people wearing these kind of like one dollar ponchos you get in hotel lobbies 
and one was pink and one was blue and one was orange and they were just kind of blowing in the wind a certain way i mean he found style in these cheap ponchos it's style not necessarily fashion but he found style it was a lovely shot of these three ponchos three or four ponchos going by on the street as people were crossing the street that day what's it mean to a photo editor to have uh a photographer like Bill Cunningham uh, in their in their stable. Uh, intimidating, because he knows so much. He's so good. At, he was his own editor. He didn't. You know, I I was not his editor, and I I always state that I I was not his editor. I was the editor for Sunday Styles, but Bill was his own editor. Bill went wherever he wanted to go, and he came back, and he met his deadlines, and and he was changing pictures till the last minute. He was a perfectionist, but. He, it, his knowledge is, is absolutely intimidating. And just his vision. He had a vision. He'd go on the street. And, and, and I said this before. It, it, he didn't, it seemed like he photographed every single person who walked by. That's not true. As I went, as I had to find specific, these are these photos from the 90s and aughts that were low res. I had to go into his archive and find the photos that I wanted for the book. But as I'm looking for the photo that I want amongst all these negatives, I'm finding all this other wonderful material. And I was just, you know, instead of going back with, you know, 15 photos, I went back with about 150 photos that we just have to have. It was just, it was, it was an endless supply. I, and I got to see what he saw. And in every single frame of the thousands of pictures that I've looked at, you always knew what he was after. You always knew what he was looking at. And some people, most of his, he only got one frame on most people. Right. He, he tried to remain invisible. And I've seen him on the street. I've seen him in operation. And he would just stand there and the camera would be at his side and he'd go like this. He'd lift it up. So many things were out of focus, yes. Uh, but sometimes that didn't matter when the picture is the size of a postage stamp. But he would just lift the camera up and down, up and down, up and down. And sometimes it was just one person. Sometimes it was just one frame on somebody. So that's an interesting point. I mean, I, I, I was surprised when you said intimidating. I never thought that would be the word that you'd, that you'd use. Bill was, yeah, I, it, just in terms of his legendary status too. He, he knew his stuff. I mean, that's just the simplest way to put it. He knew his stuff. He was an expert in his field. He was respected in his field. An entire industry followed him. So was it, was it, uh, um, was it a, a two-edged sword? Was it kind of, uh, was it hard? Was it hard to have this, this uh, overwhelming, could he, could he overshadow the whole style section if he weren't careful? How do you, how do you manage? No, 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 we loved him. Oh, we, we loved him. Everybody loved him. He was, he was a delightful human being. He was, he was adorable. Everybody loved Bill Cunningham. Everybody in the building loved Bill Cunningham. When Bill died, um, so many people made Facebook posts of, you know, he always said hi to me in the elevator. He didn't know who I was. And he was like that. He was completely charming, completely beloved, utterly, utterly beloved. So he didn't, it, it, let's, let's just say it was an honor. It was an honor to be around Bill Cunningham. It was an honor for me to have known him. It was an honor for me to watch him work and work beside him. What do you think it was in his in his in his makeup that uh, he's got this power? He's got this influence. He has this page in the New York Times in the Sunday Style section that he can do whatever he wants. Yes. He yeah. never, uh, from what I know, from what I understand, he never lost his uh, humility, and he never he never got any of the prima donna that is so easy to get in the Correct. fashion world. Yes. Correct. Um, he was a humble man. He was a very humble man. I mean, I think it's the, 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 it's a legendary story as to how he lived, which is in a, in an apartment, he had the kitchen taken out so he could have more room for his boxes and, and file cabinets. And he lived simply, he slept on a cot. I mean, he, he slept on a cot surrounded by his work. By his work. He went, he worked every, every day. He went right. to church on Sundays. He was just like yeah. a, a fashion. Yes reporter monk type of fellow yeah he this this was his world this is what he wanted to do he was passionate about it 
he was completely passionate about it and he loved it. So what, what can we learn as, as uh, what, what can a 20 year old photographer learn from a career like this or a, a work practice or what can we learn? Well, it depends on if the 20, I mean, I don't want to use the word niche, but I mean, Bill had his, you know, expertise and he had his area uh, that he operated in. You could tell a young photographer to, you know, pick something and become the best person in the world at it. Find something. Well, also what Bill was doing, there was nobody out there doing that at the time. Um, if you can find something that hasn't, it's always, it always comes down to, can you do something that hasn't been done before? And Bill did. Bill did. He did something that hadn't been done before and it grew and it grew and it became more popular and it, and he became a legend. But how does, uh, so how do you translate that into the young? I mean, there's, there's almost more photo editors today than there are photographers. How, how does a photo editor uh, make that same uh, make that same mark or make that same impact on a photographer's uh, help that photographer help the page look better help the the newspaper look better? To be on, being honest, being brutally honest, it it, it helps enormously. You've got to be able to tell somebody that something is not good, and you have to be able to tell them why something is not good. Um, and it's funny you say there's more photo editors than photographers, but we are living in a world where everybody's a photographer now because everybody has an iPhone and everybody takes a picture. When, you know, if something, if some huge news event happens in New York City, there'll be pictures of it. You don't have to wait for somebody from the AP to get there. There'll be pictures of it. There'll be more, more pictures than, than I can possibly, you know, enumerate. Um, now, the, the reason I say that about the photo editors, there is that fire hose of content coming out, but somebody has to siphon it down and get it, uh, get it into something yeah, that you yes. drink. Um, but see. some photos, I, mean, I forgot who wrote this. Somebody wrote an essay not that long ago, an older photo editor saying that, um, you know, how can you really judge a photographer when you don't see his entire take on a job? You know, you assign somebody, you know, go out and photograph, you know, this, this, you know, state fair. Okay. And then the person sends you 10 pictures, but they might've taken 300. But for me to really, I'd, I'd like to see the three. I mean, I understand that. Like, I can't really help you if, unless I see the 300 pictures. I can't really judge every, judge what you're doing. I'd like to see the stuff you don't think is good. And photographers aren't necessarily their best editors. You shoot 300 pictures and you send 10. Yeah, how do you know that's your best 10? Well, that's, that's, that's what uh, I was, you know, when you, when you talk about going through Bill's negatives or his contact sheets and you're seeing intent there. Yes. And then you see that he's building up to something and then you yep. see the successful moment when that all comes together. Yep. Photo yes. editors don't get that today. Correct, correct. And believe me, there are a lot of, and you know, there may be photo editors, sure, who are getting, you know, hundreds of pictures sent in on something. But for the most part, um, when you're shooting and you're on deadline, especially now when everything, is, they want everything posted right away, you're getting five to 20 pictures maybe on something. Um, and again, this isn't, I'm not making a blanket statement here but there are many photo you're you're only getting a fraction of what a photo what a photographer shot when you're a photo editor these days you really are you're not well, getting I, a full take right and that's what I'm, I'm what i'm driving for towards is this idea that it it doesn't benefit the photographer it doesn't benefit no. the photo editor and it doesn't benefit necessarily the, the the reader or the viewer either and we're still getting superior photography there's still there's still a, a, you know, exceptional, awesome photography out there. But I feel like if, if you want to give advice to a young photographer um, about what direction to go to, you know, it would, the more I see, you know, the better things. The, I, I would like to see the pictures that go into the one assignment. You can show me a portfolio that has 300 different pictures in it, but I'd also like to see the 300 pictures you took when you covered 
one thing. Um, that's also, to look at all that material, a photo editor can then perhaps see something that the photographer is not seeing or can see a direction to go in. Maybe somebody thinks they want to shoot portraits. Well, maybe if you look at the entire, you know, maybe there's another direction. Maybe it's not portraits. Maybe it's something else. But show me, show me, show me your whole take. Sometimes it's the shot between the takes that's actually the really good shot. Sometimes when you're when you're doing a portrait of somebody and they're standing there, it's that moment when they're exhaling, where they look really good, or where, or where the, that to me is is often the better picture. Did you, did you like being on set when you were uh, assigning for the style section? Um, when I could be, yeah. I, I didn't mind styling. We did fashion shoots. I was always there for the fashion shoots. I mean, I like to be able, it always was helpful to see, you know, if something was out of place in a fashion shoot. See, we're not allowed, we weren't allowed to retouch photographs. We didn't have the luxury of if there's some dust somewhere or, or a piece of thread somewhere to to be able to remove it. So everything had to be perfect for the shoot. So oftentimes I went to just simply scrutinize everybody and make sure everybody was was uh, camera ready. Have you have you looked at the la have you looked at the September issue this year? I, I know you have. I haven't really yet. But. No, I haven't really actually. Really? I have not. Yeah, I have not. Oh, you're talking about the uh, of wait, you're talking about Vogue oh, magazine. Yeah. No, I have not yet. I have not looked at it yet. <laughs> That could have, we could have done that together on camera. That would have been interesting. Uh, it's pretty, it's pretty fat. I, I yeah, was, and that's good. That's, that's, yeah. in, that, that's good to hear. That's. But the, so my question is, and you know, you did this for, I mean, so many times. And, and so the style section, you know, Burdorf or whoever, mm -hmm. they're going to have full page ads in the New York Times. Yep. And they're good. I, they spend a lot of money on the production of these and they can retouch and they can, you know, mm -hmm. get the, they right. can get whatever model they, any photographer, yes. yep. any yep. stylist, what's more important, what's more valuable. And so when you think of like the September issue where there's 90% ads and 10% editorial content, what's more valuable to the reader? Do you think? Oh, both of readers love to see those ads too. Those ads I do. Fire. Yeah, those those ads, first of all, there's a lot of beautiful photography in them, you know, retouching or not, there's still a lot of beautiful photography in them. And, and they're inspiring. And, and um, it gives if you're going to read that, if you're going to read the September issue, you know, you're, you're going to be interested in what people are wearing. Um, and it gives people ideas. Um, at the times, you know, we didn't have that kind of budget. So, and, and like I said, we had no retouching. So we, um, you know, we, we worked with what we could <laughs> under the circumstances that we could. I mean, the interesting thing to bring it full circle, it's kind of the anti Bill Cunningham, the, the, the September issues, anti Bill Cunningham. It's exactly opposite of what he did. Or it's <laughs> apples and oranges. It's still fashion. Right. But for me, it's, it's all about when you're looking at the September issue, you're looking at the ads, you're looking at the editorial content, and you're kind of trying to read between the lines. You're trying to, you're like reading the tea leaves, right? Mm -hmm. What's coming, what's, what's interesting, what's, what worked, what didn't. And that's kind of, when I think about it, what Bill was doing on his own every week. Every week. And he wanted, you know, he wanted to photograph people on the street. That was important to him. He wanted to see what people were wearing on the street, what consumers were buying, what are people spending money on, what is it that people have to have, what is it I, ha you know, what what is it that I want to be seen in. That was important to him. He wanted to see the consumer's point of view. He said that, I mean, one of his quotes was also, it's, it's like, it's all happening on the street. That's where the show is. The real show is on the street, not on the runway. I think that's, that's, is what's, and that's, and that's the essence of photojournalism. That's the essence yes. of. Yes, In, yes, of, of street photography. Yes, the real show is on the street. This idea, I mean, you, you know, talk about the news photographers, 
and I'll wrap it up here. I'm, I'm just, but when you talk about the news photographers and, you know, we, we can't have our snobby little clicks and all that kind of thing with, you know, who's the real photographer, that type of thing. But um, everybody, you know, you land in that, you land in that war zone. You're just looking around trying to figure out what's happening. That's mm -hmm. what every photographer, mm -hmm. everybody, they're just trying to figure out what's happening and getting a hint. They might not get a, the full picture, but they'll get a hint of it and be able to share that with the viewing audience. And I think that's what was, I mean, in my opinion, I think that's for, for a non-fashion person, for the layman, that's what I could get from a guy like Bill. And that's what I can get from, you know, the photographers doing the, the, the real photography. And that's what Bill wanted. Bill, that's what Bill wants his readers to see. He wants, to, he wants everybody to see what's out there. This is what's happening now. That was his, that's news to him. That was his news. Yeah. Well, th Tina, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm going to put a link, an Amazon link to the book, and I'm going to have to get my own copy uh, because, you know, I love his work. I love fashion photography in general. Um, but I really love that, that combination of the real world, the marketplace in action. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, you get a sense of Bill's um, sense of humor in the book, too. Well, you did a wonderful job. I can tell uh, the edit because I learned something from your edit just looking at the book. And that's, uh, that's the essence of great uh, photo editing. And I thank you for that, too. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay.